Over the centuries, much has been written about the women of Allah's paradise. It's easy to see why this is the case, given the speculation that the Quran invites. The Quran speaks of maidens confined in tents, assuring the reader that no man or jinn has had sex with them. They are said to have large breasts. And in case you missed it the first time, yes, they are virgins. As I mentioned, there's been much speculation by Muslim scholars over the centuries about these women of paradise. The Encyclopedia of Islam lists some such speculation. They come in four colors. Their skin is transparent, and on the breast of each are inscribed two names, the name of Allah and the name of her husband. Bukhari transmits a report from Muhammad, which gives us a little more detail on their delicate skin. The Prophet said that the marrow of the bones of their legs will be seen through the bones and flesh. For us moderns, this see-through description certainly brings to mind the image of an x-ray, which certainly lessens the appeal of the description of these heavenly virgins. Muhammad elaborates further. The Messenger of Allah said there is none whom Allah will admit to paradise, but Allah will marry him to 72 wives, two from Huris and 70 from his inheritance, from the people of hell, all of whom will have desirable front passages, and he will have a male member that never becomes flaccid. Elaborating even more on this theme, Muhammad said the believer shall be given in paradise such and such strength and intercourse. It was said, O Messenger of Allah, and will he be able to do that? He said, he will be given the strength of a hundred. Note that the sexual power of men in paradise is equal to that of 100 earthling men, coming in well over even Muhammad's earthling sexual strength of only 30 men. I'll leave it to the scholars to decide whether or not Muhammad's sexual strength in the afterlife is also 30 times more than that of other men in the afterlife. If so, this would make his sexual power in paradise equivalent to the combined sexual strength of 3,000 earthling men or something. Yay. Additionally, as we know from Muhammad, women are the majority in hell. But in a curious plot twist, women are also apparently the majority in heaven, since each believing man gets a lot of women, from two to a few hundred to several thousand, depending on the source, which is why men need a lot of sexual power in paradise. Women are the majority in Islamic hell and Islamic heaven, though one wonders which one is worse for them. Now, if you're trying to make sense of all this, who exactly are the Horis, where do they come from, how do they integrate with the earthling women in paradise, and so forth, consider that if you were actually looking for coherent, sensible content, you wouldn't still be watching a video on this topic. So just let it be what it is. It's also a well-known fact that, as the Encyclopedia of the Quran points out, the promise of the Paradise Virgins served as motivation for Muslim men to engage in holy war from very early in the history of Islam. Die in battle, go straight to Paradise, get more virgins. So that's one purpose of these traditions of the Heavenly Virgins. But there's another purpose. Hadith about these Heavenly Virgins occur in a network of Hadith which seem to exist primarily to subjugate women. The Prophet said, Whenever a woman harms her husband in this world, that is, without any due right, his wife among the Horis in Jannah says, You must not harm him. May Allah destroy you. He is only a passing guest with you and is about to leave you to come to us. Note that Allah's virgins taunt the earthling women who unfortunately are of different ages, may or may not have entirely desirable physical features, are not, in fact, see-through, and are not perpetual virgins. I bet the earthling Muslim women feel vastly inferior, especially if they've recently been mocked by one of Allah's virgins, as the Hadith describes. Now let's compare this to another Hadith. The Prophet said, If a woman spends the night deserting her husband's bed, then the angels send their curses on her till she comes back to her husband. Notice the parallels from these last two reports. They both have to do with a woman and her husband. In both cases, the woman fails to please the husband. In both cases, the woman is condemned by an inhabitant of Jenna. And in both cases, the condemnation comes in the form of a curse. The women of earth are temporary fixtures for their husbands. They are simply Allah's prototypes. He'll do better in the next life. He promised. And so all of this keeps earthly women in line 
lest curses be hailed down upon their inferior selves, and also keeps men lusting after law's paradise. Let's end with some questions. Why is it that a book supposedly from God describes an afterlife that appears customized for the sexual satisfaction of men? Why did the prophet of Islam further describe these women and the pleasures of paradise so obscenely? Why did he use the virgins of paradise, along with the angels, to threaten women in this life? And a related question, why does paradise sound like it's full of beings who bully and harass women? How is it that Muslim women aren't supposed to feel eternally inferior in comparison to Allah's specially created women? Why would the God of the universe be interested in miraculously boosting the sexual power of men in the afterlife? And why is it that Muslims tolerate this nonsense in their scriptures and traditions when, if it existed somewhere else, it would be their number one polemic? Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.